everyone. Uh, we're going to wait about 30 seconds or so, and uh, we'll get started. So everyone to get situated. I think we got one more small video to watch. Hello, and uh, welcome to our Color Edge Creative Mastermind webinar. My name is Kevin Burke, and I'm a product manager here at Azo, and I'll be your host today. We're hosting an ongoing series of these webinars featuring Azo Color Edge power users who are also recognized leaders in their profession, including photography, print, digital art, animation, visual effects, and post production. The creative Mastermind webinar series is brought to you by Azo, the makers of this year's Academy Award winning Color Edge self calibrating color accurate monitors, preferred by the most discerning creative people everywhere. Today, we're pleased to have professional photographer and Azo Color Edge monitor user Michael Clark, who will be talking about a wider range of topics relating to his work and what's near and dear to his heart. Please send your questions for Michael in the chat and we'll do our best to answer all of them at the end of the main part of Michael's presentation. Um, but to get on with the bio, uh, Michael is an internationally published adventure photographer, um, specializing in adventure sports, travel, landscape photography. Um, he produces intense, raw images of athletes pushing their sports to the limit and has risked life and limb on numerous assignments to bring back stunning images of rock climbers, mountaineers, kayakers, mountain bikers, big wave sur surfers, skydivers, just to name a few, um, often working in remote locations around the world. He uses unique angles, bold colors, strong graphics, and cutting edge dramatic lighting techniques to capture fleeting moments of passion, gusto, flair, bravado in the world of the great outdoors. Balancing extreme action with subtle details, striking portraits and wild landscapes, he creates images for the editorial, advertising, and stock photo markets worldwide. As a former physicist, Michael has worked on both sides of the technical revolution, helping refine the technology and using it for his current profession, photography. Michael has worked as a professional photographer since 1996. That makes 25 years if I do my math right, Michael. Uh, he's been featured in numerous publications for his work with uh, extreme sports. He contributes to National Geographic, Sports Illustrated, Outside, um, the New York Times, among many others. And some a sample, a sampling of some of his advertising clients include Apple, Nike, Fujifilm, Adobe, and Red Bull, among many others. So quite the resume. Uh, so welcome, Michael. And uh, and. Go ahead and, uh, and take it from here. But one thing, um, just to remind you, um, we'll grab some questions at the end, hopefully all of them. Um, go ahead and send them in the chat. Welcome, Michael. Awesome. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks for having me. Um, thank you to Azo for having me and for being such a good sponsor um, over the last few years and for making the best monitors that I know of on planet Earth especially for us photographers and you know cinematographers who need to have color accurate monitors. There's nothing else out there that's as good as an ASO. So uh, we'll talk more about that at the end um, and how I deal with my imagery and how I work it up. Um, but this talk is entitled The Other Side of Fear. Uh, this comes from a quote that I blurted out in an interview that I was like, wow, that's quite uh, deep. Um, a fulfilled life lives on the other side of fear. Um, and by that, I mean that, you know, unless you're consistently trying to overcome fears, you just won't know what's on the other side of that fear. Like overcoming that fear opens up a whole new world of possibilities. Um, and I found that to be true in my life and in my endeavors, both as an athlete and also as a photographer. So as Kevin said, I started out way back in 95, 96, I was living in France. 
Um, early on in my career, this is me hanging about six or 700 feet off the ground on a big cliff in Mexico. This was an outdoor photographer and the next page featured Galen Rao. So this was like year three of my career and I was right next to Galen Rao. So I was pretty excited about that. Uh, but this also gives you a sense of what it's like for me when I'm hanging out up there with the climbers. Um, and I started my career basically just shooting rock climbing and mountaineering and all forms of climbing um, and did that for the first five or six years. This is Chris Sharma, who's still one of the best climbers in the world. Um, this is a sport called deep water soloing. So he doesn't have a harness on, he has no rope. He's just climbing up a sea cliff. This is in Mallorca, Spain, um, in the Mediterranean Ocean. And the cliff's about a hundred feet tall. And if he falls, he's gonna fall into the water below, which may not seem too bad, but he's 70 feet up at this point. So that water is gonna feel pretty intense if he fell into that, especially if he didn't fall cleanly straight into it. Um, you know, I also started branching out into mountain biking. Um, just to give you the lay of land, I'll start out kind of just giving you a sampling of the images I create in typical. I'm an adventure sports photographer, as Kevin said, but um, kind of go through my career to some degree and just show you the, the arc of my career and how it's developed uh, from these early days shooting rock climbing and mountain biking, and then essentially broadening out into all the adventure sports and quite a bit of other stuff as well. Um, I live in Santa Fe, New Mexico. So there's a plethora of outdoor adventure stuff here right around me in the state. This is on the Rio Grande in the northern part of the state. Um, early kayaking pictures. Uh, it's funny that you'll see these early pictures, then later on you'll see like more recent stuff to kind of see how I've grown as a photographer and how I've expanded my craft so to speak. This is White Sands, New Mexico and Southern New Mexico. Um, one of my favorite places in the United States, it's like visiting Antarctica, but it's typically quite warm. Warmer than Antarctica would be, that's for sure. Uh, this is at the Albuquerque Balloon Fiesta, which is the largest hot air ballooning festival in the world. And I was able to actually talk my way into the inner part of the balloon while they're filling it up just with air, not with you know butane flame yet. Um, so, and this, these ghost-like figures here was what I was hoping for. I was waiting for something like that to happen. And this was the crew of the balloon pushing up the sides of the balloon so it would inflate faster because there's probably four or 500 other balloons filling up and taking off at the same time. And they wanted to get a jump on all those other balloons so they could get out of there faster. Um, and I do a fair bit of portraiture as well. I've really worked on my portraiture a lot over the last I would say 15, 17 years or so, maybe a little longer. Um, and that's a key part of my photography. Um, and lighting, as you'll see later on in the show, is a huge part of my photography these days. And for the last maybe 10 to 12 years, I, it's, it's what I'm really well known for actually and how I use various lighting techniques in the outdoors to light up stuff fairly far away from the camera. Um, so. And in the midst of that, I travel, well, in non-COVID times, I travel a lot, typically, you know, six to eight months a year, and often in very remote locations, like this is the Patagonia ice cap um, on the western side, which is a very difficult side to get to. We traverse the Patagonia ice cap, and that's Cerro Torre there, center frame in the top, which is a very famous peak. Um, this is the skyline that Patagonia, the clothing company, is named for. Um, so here's one of the, that picture of Chris Sharma. They didn't use the one that I showed you earlier, which I feel is the better image, but they use this image. This is for men's journal. This was 2004. So this was early on in my career. So I, you know, as you can see, I travel quite a bit, um, early on in my career, I did a lot of editorial photography for magazines. Um, and these days I've kind of, you know, in the last, 10 to 12 years, 15 years, I've moved more into the commercial side of photography where I'm shooting mostly for larger clients, as Kevin indicated. Um, and you'll see a lot of work for some of those clients here. Um, I have written a couple books. Um, this is my first printed book. Um, I have two eBooks as well. Um, and it was one of the first adventure, well, it was the first adventure photography kind of how-to book ever published. 
where we went through how to photograph a whole bunch of different sports. Um, and in that book that, you know, there were 12 sports they wanted me to photograph that were the main 12 sports in the adventure space. But living in New Mexico, surfing was one of those sports that I just had not photographed that much of because I live in New Mexico. And even though I travel a lot, I just didn't know the surf culture because I'm not a surfer myself. Um, so I had to do some research and find some friends. And um, I met this guy named Brian Bielman, who's one of the most legendary surfing photographers in the world. He's one of my closest friends these days. This is way back in 2008. Um, and through him, I got to go shoot at Pipeline and then also photograph the Eddie I Cow, which is at Waimea Bay, just down the way from Pipeline. Um, so I've made probably 15 trips in a dozen years to Hawaii and Tahiti, Portugal, all over the world, shooting on some of the biggest waves in the world with Brian. Um, and most of that I do for one of my clients, Apple, who's used several of my images of surfing and also of ice climbing on their computers to help sell computers, including this image that we're looking at right now. So uh, the Eddie I Cow, this is way back in 2009, changed surfing forever. This was the first time that anybody had actually paddled into 55, 60 foot waves um, that, well, en masse, I mean, that did it on a regular basis this day. And so that day kind of changed surfing. Toe-in surfing was then relegated maybe to only days much bigger than this uh, where the waves were traveling faster. So pretty cool to be there for some of these events and to see some of these changes in sports, especially surfing, which I've surfed a couple times, but I definitely would not call myself a surfer. Um, this is not a 50 foot wave. This is maybe a 40 foot wave face, still a giant wave. And the interesting thing you can see here is once they, he launches off the top of this wave, it's basically free falling, free falling down half of the face of the wave until he hits it again and then has to somehow stabilize the board and you know keep going and not fall. Um, so it's pretty impressive when these surfers are taken off on some of these waves. Sometimes, as in this picture, they don't make it and they cartwheel down the face of a 50 or 60 foot wave. This is a giant wave. And in this image, you can't even see like a third of the wave. The bottom of this wave is below the bottom of the picture here. Um, so, I mean, there's both sides. No, luckily, nobody got hurt this day. Um, giant waves, you know, super dangerous. I'm on the shore with a big lens here. So, um, and in the midst of surf, shooting surfing, you know, this is what's happening at dawn on the shore. Um, so this was shot before those other images were actually shot, I think the day before even, and we're shooting from the side up on a cliff. And this is right as the sun hit the waves and the waves are just exploding, you know, as they're coming into the shore uh, at Waimea Bay on a really big day. So, I mean, this isn't that big of a wave in terms of those ones I was just showing you. This might be a 15 foot wave in that little inner part of it. But that's after it was like a 60 or 70 foot wave, you know, a kilometer offshore. It ended up looking like this. Um, this is a really messy day at Pipeline, but a really wild image just showing how, you know, wild and wooly it can get out there with the wind kind of tearing apart the wave. And typically I wouldn't consider this to be a great surf shot because it is really messy with all the white water. But this one ended up on, you know, all over the place. Apple used it for years on their iMac 5K um, to help sell that computer. Um, so, you know, I don't really work in the surf industry that much. I've had my images in surf magazines, but I'm mostly shooting surfing for commercial purposes um, and to license the images after the fact. Um, one of my biggest clients these days, and still to this day, for the last maybe 12 or 13 years, I've been working with Red Bull quite a bit. And if you know anything about Red Bull, they've got some of the best outdoor adventure athletes in the world in just about any and every sport you can think of. Everything from tennis, soccer, you know, even foot, you know, NFL football to, you know, Danny McCaskill here, who's a world famous trials rider. So his bike is, it's like a cross between a BMX bike and a mountain bike. It's neither really, but it's a hybrid bike that he can do all these stunts on. Um, and he had just signed with Red Bull like the day before the shoot. This was actually my first shoot ever with Red Bull um, way back in 2008. Um, 
and we shot with him for a full day in uh, San Diego. Sorry, just had to get over my brain fart there to remember where it was. This is right in front of the airport, actually. And the funny story with this image, this is towards the end of the day at sunset. We'd already been shooting for like 12 hours at this point. And we had scoped out all these different things all over San Diego to go through. And so he could like do all these tricks and jump off this or do that. And, you know, we were getting kicked out of places probably three or four times before this. So we were very aware that we weren't always wanted where we were. We did have permits for some of the places we went to, but we didn't have a permit for this place because this is actually a traffic circle. And I'll just tell this story because it's pretty funny. Um, but in this image, um, since it's a traffic circle, he had done this like three or four times and just flew off the bike until he got it dialed. And then he could do it on command, the backflip off of this sculpture, which is a giant iron, like three ton sculpture. So we weren't gonna hurt the sculpture at all. Um, and the thing's probably 15, 20 feet tall. I'm laying on the ground with a fisheye and we saw a policeman roll up in the traffic circle just behind the camera. Um, or just behind the sculpture back there where those cars are. And since we've been getting kicked out of places kind of all day, I put the camera down and I thought, well, we're shut down, that's it, that's the end of this. But Danny was already on his way in, so I put the camera back to my eye and shot some photos and the policeman rolled down his window and was like, oh, hell yeah, that was amazing. And it's like, okay, we can keep going. So it's just kind of funny how things work out. Some people are really excited to see this and some people aren't. Um, I've also done a lot of work with the Red Bull Air Force. I've shot with them actually twice in the last month, and I'm going to shoot with them again later this week at the Indianapolis 500. Um, so if you want to see them jump, watch the Indy 500 this weekend. Uh, this is a picture from Notch Peak. It's a 3,000 foot cliff in southern Utah, um, and they're just jumping off the edge. And the crazy thing for me is sometimes you know, I'm taking as much risk as the athletes to get the picture. So what happened in this picture is I down climbed over the edge of the cliff. I had a rope on, but it was tied to a bunch of bushes that were just about the size of my index finger. You know, I must have tied off like 20 of those bushes and they would not have held my weight at all. I mean, they had ripped out immediately. So, you know, that was more a psychological rope than it was anything else, but I'm just right below the edge and then snapping, firing away pictures as he jumps off the cliff. Um, and this was like a minute long, maybe 60, 70 second long flight for them. They landed down in that river basin below. Um, and I get to hang out of a lot of helicopters and aircraft. This was shot from a helicopter with Levi Cyber, who's one of the world's best windsurfers. He was setting world records that day for the highest jumps off of waves using the wave as like a ramp, getting 60 to 70 feet in the air. Um, this is again, the Red Bull Air Force. I mean, I've shot with them so many times when I show up, they tend to come up with crazy ideas. So the guy flying the helicopter is Felix Baumgartner. Um, you might remember him as the skydiver who jumped out of space back in like 2007 and they shut down the internet because there were like 10 million, 20 million people watching it live and it clogged up the internet or something, but he's flying the helicopter. Kirby Chambliss, Chambliss is flying the plane. He's a world renowned stunt pilot. And this is John DeVore. And I think Luke Aikens here, they jumped off the skid of the helicopter over the plane. Um, you might know John, actually he's the head of the captain of the team and he's been in Point Break in some of the Transformers movies. Hollywood calls these guys a lot because they're the best in the world at what they do. Um, I can't say that I took this shot, but I set this up and set my camera to shoot four frames a second continually. Um, the camera is on the head of Andy Farrington, which I think is the next slide. Let me show you that. Well, maybe it's not, but I had the camera mounted on his hel helmet and then I just kind of drew out on a piece of paper kind of what I was looking for. And he's an expert photographer himself for skydiving. Um, just so we could get this super wide perspective um, of these guys falling, which imagine if you did this every other day of your life, the perspective you would have in terms of the other side of fear. I mean, these, there's, there's women and men on the Red Bull Air Force. So it's, it's, they're like Superman and Superwoman. I mean, they just have this expanded idea of what's possible in the world. I mean, imagine this picture, this is Miles Deicher, another member of the team base jumping off, uh, this is one of the spires in the Fisher Tower. So it's like a thousand foot spire. 
just the very top of it, obviously. I mean, imagine running off the edge of something like that. That is just, even for me, I'm not a base jumper or a skydiver. Um, and I've been around it a lot, but still that is, you've got to be very comfortable, you know, with how you can fly in your parachuting skills. Um, and then eventually I live in Santa Fe, Outside Magazine is based here. And I used to meet with one of the photo editors at Outside Magazine named Rob Haggart. He's actually quite famous now because he runs a website called a photoeditor.com, which kind of reveals what it's like to be a photo editor at a magazine. Um, and when I met with him, he was like, you adventure guys are all the same. You can't let your way out of a paper bag. Um, like, I can't hire you is what he told me because you can't create a decent portrait. Sure, you can get a picture of somebody, but I wouldn't call it like a high-end portrait. And he was right. You know, all of us in the film days, all of us adventure photographers were terrified of flashes because, you know, you just didn't know how the image would turn out and we didn't have enough experience using strobes, which are just big flashes um, or speed lights, which are, you know, smaller ones you stick on your camera to really dial it in, you know, to get images on film. You know, some of us had better skills than others, but he really challenged me to buy some strobes and work with them to create better portraiture. But in the meantime, while I was working on my portraiture, I thought, hey, these strobes can light up caves. They can do all this other stuff. And I should really play with these and see what I can do to create something new and different for the sports that I photograph. Um, this image in particular was ahead of its time by two or three years because all the magazines, the people that I sent this through, they're like, we've never seen images like this of climbing with strobes and flash. So we don't even know what to do with it. It took like four or five years before it to get published in the magazines just because nobody, it took a while for this to catch on using strobes in the outdoors. Uh, this is maybe one of my most, most well-known images and Apple uses this one for many, I think they're still using it actually um, on their computers to advertise computers. But uh, Dawn Glank here is uh, one of the best ice climb, female ice climbers in the world. And we put a big strobe up on a bridge above her and that's why this looks kind of hyper real lit up this way. This is in a deep canyon in Uray, Colorado um, called Uray Ice Park. And it's maybe 200 feet tall, this section. And it's a very narrow canyon. So I rappelled down the other side of the canyon to be kind of right across where she, I wanted her to be um, as she climbed up. And then I was wirelessly triggering the strobe, which is on the bridge above her. Um, and then I kept pushing the strobe technology and I've worked with the Lincrome, who's another one of my sponsors for a long time. There are Swiss strobe manufacturers and they agreed to ship five or four extra strobes. I had one and they shipped four more from Switzerland all the way to Hawaii. And I had four assistants this day. And the idea is these are some of the most powerful battery powered strobes on the market. Can I light up a surfer on a wave from like five or 600 feet away. And to give you an idea, that's like a football field and a half in distance. So that's pretty sinking far away from where the strobes are. And this is Tommy, he's a pro surfer. Um, so we're at this, I don't think we're at, we weren't at uh, oh, Pipeline. This is just up the way from Pipeline, another wave at Rocky Point where you get more aerials. It wasn't even that great of a wave day. The waves were kind of messy. He only got like two or three aerials and this is one of them. This is the only shot we got because it was so difficult to pull off. But this is like two o'clock in the afternoon, full sun, no clouds. We were able to darken down the background and light him up from such a far distance. And I, this isn't my best surf picture by any means. Um, this, I wouldn't even call it a great surf picture. It was just a proving the point of what's possible like, okay, if we add more strobes to the equation, we can light stuff up farther away and get something different. Not necessarily good, but different. Um, I went back to the ice park a couple of years after that first thing, because this is the real image I had in mind that I really wanted to get, um, but I just didn't have the experience yet to make this happen. So this is only 50 feet away from where that other ice climbing image was shot, but I repelled it to a different area and got kind of a different perspective. Um, and maybe did a little nicer job of subtly lighting the climb as if a ray of sunlight's coming in there. So with all this adventure sports stuff, I'm trying to light up the athlete or the person in the image in a very subtle way, which sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. 
um, so that it looks as if, oh, a beam of light like just shot out of the middle of a cloud and just hit this for a second or two. So it's not like, you know, some alien light shining in from above, just artificial light. Um, and here's some, some a mountain bike shoot with full sun where I'm working with the sun to create something kind of hyper real and dynamic. Um, and the whole point of all this flash stuff is basically just to be able to control the lighting on your subject more. But also for me as a professional to stand out from the crowd and do something that, you know, not everybody can do a and also that looks different than what everybody else is producing. Um, this is a good example. This is two strobes, um, small strobes actually, you know, on a day at Angel Fire shooting for the Angel Fire, Fire Ski Resort here in New Mexico. And it just snowed like two or three feet. It was incredibly wet, heavy snow, but you know, the snowboarders and skiers were able to just rip through this and create this pretty amazing wall of snow as they ripped by. And I just put the flashes behind them to light it up. Um, and this is another example. This is Kai Leitner, who's uh, up and coming, one of the best climbers in the world and Smith Rocks. There's two strobes a hundred feet away. And on this stormy day, it just really helped us highlight him and create something that's very dramatic. Um, so we'll jump in here. Let me just get out of the show and see what time it is, how we're doing on time. Um, I'll just show you some of these images. These are some of my most well-known images here. Uh, I did a shoot for the launch of one of Alinkrom's strobes called the ELB 1200, which is a 1200 watt second battery powered strobe, um, which means it's incredibly powerful. Um, and for that, we teamed up with Red Bull to work with this guy, Rafa Ortiz, who's probably one of the best two or three kayakers on the planet. And he has gone off a 189 foot waterfall. He's one of two people to ever do that height. That's the biggest waterfall anybody's ever gone over in a kayak. Um, which is crazy. I mean, if you live in a big city and you have 20 story buildings, imagine going off the top of a 20 story building in a kayak. That's just mind blowing. So, but for this, we, you know, with a flash, you only get one picture every time you take a picture with the flash because the flash takes two seconds to recycle. So I had to pick a smaller waterfall. It's just as Spirit Falls, um, which is in Southern Washington. And this is on one of the most difficult rivers in the world. This waterfall itself is class five. It's very technical, very dangerous, but it's much shorter. I think it's only like 45 feet tall. Um, and the reason we picked this is because I need him to do it like 10 or 15 times. So I can get, I'll get 10 or 15, I get one shot every time he does it. So uh, this was one of the main shots they use for the advertising. And there's actually two flashes coming in on this one, one from above him and the left and one from the far right um, lighting him up. So this is not shot in sunshine. All the light you see here is created by the flashes. Um, during the middle of the day, it was just shaded in this canyon. This gives you a better sense. So there's a flash upper left. You can see it hitting the top of that grass up there. Um, and this is one of the safety kayakers that we had on the shoot. We had two safety kayakers, Liam and Rush, and they were both incredible kayakers themselves. So I didn't expect them to run it, but they ended up running it, which was great. So I could use them as test subjects to try out the lighting before Rafa went over since he was the main athlete for the shoot. Um, and the whole point of the shoot was just to show how capable this flash was. Um, but, you know, we're in this amphitheater that's just epic. It was a huge water year. I think this was 2017 when we shot this. Um, and this place has been photographed a lot by basically every adventure photographer in the world. So it wasn't the place I was, you know, wasn't top of my list just because it had been photographed so much. Um, but because it had so much access almost all the way around the waterfall, it really allowed us to get the lighting in there and do something completely different. So a lot of my peers have basically said, you could never tell this was Spirit Falls just because it looks so different because of the lighting. Um, for some of these, I repelled in right next to Rafa. So I'd be standing on this like illuminated bump of grass right out there and leaning over maybe only four or five feet away of, from him when he came over the falls. And this is pulled back on the other side of the falls with a little bit of a longer lens. Um, this gives you a much better idea of the amphitheater we were working in. And as you can see, like 
where I'm standing was where one of the flashes were for the action shots that I just showed you. The other flash was over there right next to the waterfall on the left um, side of the image. But I mean, this is the beauty of digital also is that Rafa could, they, they could all come by and see because they basically descend this next little waterfall just below out of frame here on the lower right, um, get out of their boats and they could hike back around and do it again. Um, but they could see the images every time they dropped. And then I would keep shooting from different angles, in different positions with different lighting, just so we could get a variety of images to deliver to the client. Um, the funny, well, it's not funny, but this is super dangerous. So the reason I have Rafa and these guys is that you get the best in the world so nobody gets injured because I mean, that is just a cauldron of water down there at the bottom. And if anything goes wrong, I mean, this is technically the most difficult river on the planet, um, which is why every pro kayaker in the world lives right next to this thing in White Sam in Washington. Um, but you know, you get the best in the world because they can do it safely. But even so, I remember Rush after the first day of just we did ten drops over the waterfall for each of the three kayakers, and Rush the next morning, the last day of the shoot was like. I don't know how many more times I can do it because I can feel my organs inside my body are bruised already. So every time they dropped and hit the water, it was like getting in a major car accident. Um, so just to give you some context, we were also able to rappel behind the waterfall and get these wild images. Um, there's actually a behind the scenes video, which I, we don't have time to show here, but on my website, there's quite a few behind the scenes videos for my shoots on my website. Um, where you can see, I think it's a six or seven minute video that shows that how this shoot, you know, came to fruition and what happened. Um, we essentially took like four or 500 pounds of lighting gear down a thousand foot cliff to get to this position to shoot all these images for three days straight. Um, this is maybe my favorite image from the shoot, but just gives you an idea how far I've taken the lighting. Um, Lately, I've had the honor of working with Fujifilm on both the original GFX 100 two years ago uh, for the launch of that camera, and also more recently, uh, just last fall, with the GFX 100S, which is the new version of their 102 megapixel camera. Um, and I think that launched in late January or early February, I can't remember the exact date. Uh, but I just thought I'd show you some of these so you can see what it's like working on a big commercial assignment. Um, this was, it turned out to be a downhill skateboarding assignment. And these are, if you look at fujifilm-x.com, that's their main website for their cameras. Uh, you'll see a bunch of these images on there. Um, and I'd actually never photographed downhill skating before, um, but it turns out it's very similar to road cycling. It's just the person's on a board, you know, in a little different crouch position than on a bike. Um, and had to learn some key things about the sport to kind of, you know, pull it off. It's very interesting to see how the sport works. And it's not something you see that often, at least not here in New Mexico, because it's kind of an underground sport because they usually don't close down roads when they do their sport. They just go for it. And they can easily do 60 to 70 miles an hour on these steep roads or faster up to 100 miles an hour easily. Um, and they do have soft wheels so they can run over a rock or anything. And it's not like, you know, when you're a kid and had a skateboard and you just go flying when you hit a rock because uh, you have very hard wheels on those old school skateboards. Um, but again, we incorporated a lot of flash work with this. This is a motion blur shot out of a truck and an assistant's holding a big flash on a boom pole. Um, same deal here. So they're flying by us on the, in the other lane. We did have police. This was shot, you know, in November, just before Thanksgiving last year. So we had police shutting down the road. We had a COVID officer and a fairly small crew. There was probably 12 of us total, including the athletes. Um, so we tried to keep the crew as, you know, small as possible. We had a COVID officer who tested us before the shoot and was just watching the whole shoot um, to make sure we were staying socially distanced from each other as much as possible which wasn't so much of a problem for the athletes here because they're not next to us. Um, and then this guy, Ryan Farmer, he's the world champion downhill skateboarder. So again, you know, for a lot of the stuff I photograph, I try to get the best in the world in their discipline um, because A, they can do more and B, they can be safer so nobody gets hurt. Um, we shot a lot of portraiture um, on this as well and some lifestyle stuff, some behind the scenes images. 
I mean, and this is a 102 megapixel camera. These aren't full res images here, obviously, uh, but the detail and the quality of these images are just epic, um, which feeds back into the monitor. So I'm showing you this picture, was, which was not shot um, on this assignment. I shot this last summer, um, just testing out the camera's autofocus capability and also some color stuff. Um, and this is where monitors are so key because if you're gonna pull color grades and color casts and add, tweak the colors in your images, you wanna, be, you wanna know that what you're seeing on your monitor is actually what it really is so that when you make a print, it looks identical. Um, so I was playing with all these wild color casts. Um, some of these are built into the Fuji cameras. I think it's color classic Chrome is what this was and then tweaking the raw image even further uh, just to kind of get a different feel. And I thought, you know, this sport of downhill skating really kind of lends itself to color cast and kind of, you know, tweaked wild colors, especially because we did a bunch of these motion blurs and motion pans with strobes, um, you know, and it just has this kind of surfing vibe where I started adding like you can see cyan tints, maybe some magenta tints to parts of the image. And especially, this isn't the key one. I think we're gonna to get to it soon. Here's one of the key ones. But you can see in the background, there's kind of a magenta tint. And in the foreground, there's kind of a cyan tint. And that was added in the post-production. We didn't use gels or filters on the flashes out there. Just gave us more options. Um, this is actually the main image they ended up using almost everywhere for the launch of the camera. And there's two strobes, as you can tell by the shadows, which are pretty obvious, but you can also see, you know, this magenta cyan color tint that I added in there and tried to be very subtle about it. And, you know, my ISO 319X was critical, you know, for this, just to know that I'm not overdoing it or it's exactly where I want it to be. Um, so just to give you an idea of my office here, when I stop sharing, you can actually see this, but um that desk is right behind me and you know i have a print viewing box right next to it a bunch of hard drives and i think this is my 319x here um you know that is hyper critical to me and i'm known for having really good color in my images i've been hired by clients telling me they know they're going to get a solid file from me um, and a big part of that is the monitor and the monitor's ability to calibrate itself um, so this is actually an image from the GFX 100 a few years ago. So with that, let me uh, finish this. Thank you to Azo for having me. Um, and you're welcome. Thank you for for being part of it and and bringing. And I know in the. <laughs> do we still have time for me to work up an image real quick, or like five more minutes? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Let me open Lightroom. Are there any questions while we're waiting for Lightroom to open? Um, we do have some questions. Um, I guess I guess I could ask one that's related to what you were just talking about. Um, you know, just okay. overall, what's the scariest situation you've been involved in for you? Well, um, let's just say if I if there's such a thing as nine lives, like you know, cats have, I've used up seven of them pretty seriously. <laughs> I should technically be dead now. Um, I've had two or three calls that were where I've had minutes to know I'm going to die within the next few seconds. Mm -hmm. I've had my rope cut down to about a strand and a half of the core. I've been in an avalanche. I've been stuck in quicksand um, in South America and in one of the most remote places I've ever been to. Uh, what else? Jeez. I've almost been cut in half by a boulder falling off a cliff that ended up glancing off my back. Um, I can't even remember them all. I got hit on my road bike by a car and flew like 70 feet, landed on my face. So if you see this scar right here, that's from that accident. Um, yeah, I mean, there's too many stories to tell. And honestly, a few of them, if I tell them in too much detail, I get pretty shaky because I can put myself back there a little too easily. So, I mean, there is a cost to doing all this stuff, but a lot of the sports, like climbing, I would say is the safest sport I photograph by far, um, just because compared to wingsuit base jumping, 
it is quite safe. Um, and, you know, for most of us, the most dangerous thing we probably do is drive our car. Get in the that's, car and go to the grocery store. Exactly. That's way more dangerous than rock climbing, typically. Um, or skiing. If you go downhill skiing, that's probably the most dangerous activity you do on a regular basis and may not realize just how dangerous it is um, or can be. Anyway, I kind of went off on a tangent there, but let me just show like for a landscape okay. image, you know, I use Lightroom and Capture One. I'm not, I use Capture One for portraits more often and Lightroom for everything else. And here's a picture from Canyonlands in um, Utah, just outside of Moab. And I just thought I'd work this guy up because it's not super dark. It's got a fair bit of contrast. And even though nothing's really clipped, we can see up here in the histogram on either end, it's quite dark and, you know, down in those canyons. And I can hold the option key to kind of pull those shadows down and pull up these, or pull the highlights down and pull up the shadows here to even out the tones. Just the overall exposure. For this one, I might even draw a little graduated filter. And I'm going to go fast just because we don't have a ton of time here. And just kind of drop that down so they're closer together in brightness. And that way, when I come back out of this localized adjustment and pull this up, it looks a little more even. I can hold down the option key here and just kind of set my endpoints for white and black a little more accurately. Add some clarity, some vibrance, some saturation. Um, come down here and add some mid-tone contrast. And I am working this up, just so you know, on my laptop, just because that's easier on Zoom. My, you know, if I was working up this image, I would be working up on that monitor back there because it's way more color accurate than my laptop. And luckily for me, most of my clients don't want images like that night. I'm not a photojournalist, so there's time for me to come home or we have an ASO on set or, you know, there wherever I'm doing the shoot to work up the images on an actual calibrated monitor. Um, so let's just see what else we can do. This was shot at ISO 800, so there might be a little noise, but not enough for me to get excited. Um, do a little chromatic aberration removal. Use this profile. Usually tend to turn that off because I like the way the lens distorted a little bit. And I like a little bit of the vignetting, so I'll just pull that back and I might even add a little bit more vignetting. Not that much, but I'll pull that off just enough to get you to the center of the frame. And you know, all the things I'm doing here, I'm essentially trying to massage the tones in the image to help your eye move around the image, you know, a little easier. Let's see. I could imagine if you had this open full screen on any monitor, you would want it to be accurate in totally. all areas, all sectors, corners. Edge to corners. edge. I mean, that's one of the crazy things when I teach workshops on digital workflow or when I'm teaching on an, any topic, you know, we talk about digital workflow. You know, if I am darkening down this corner over here, you know, or even this one over here closer to the edge of the frame and my monitor just happens to be a little darker on that side of the frame and I don't know that, then I'm, you know, working in some kind of fantasy land that doesn't really, you won't see that until you make a print. Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty of the ASO monitors is that corner to corner, edge to edge, you know, they're uniform everywhere. So you know that the color you're seeing is critically accurate. And even in black and white, it's even more critical. Um, so you can see color casts in your black and white, which is very easy to have a magenta color cast or something like that. So I'll just export this out of here real quick and open it in Photoshop. And I'm going to quit Lightroom before we do that. You, um, when you provide images to a paying client, mm -hmm. um, are they first seeing it on a computer monitor or are you printing it? They're seeing it on a computer monitor. I'm very few of my clients see a print unless they order a print, I'm guessing. Um, but let's say for something like the Fujifilm launch of that camera or any camera, you know, that I've shot for. Let me just open this up in Photoshop here. Once I find it, I think it's that one. Um, you know, they're going to find out really quick if my color management was bad 
they might put it on their website and in you know lots of places online. Oops, I dragged that to the wrong place. Sorry. Um, but you know they're going to be printing that image as well for brochures, for maybe you know displays, for booths, and all kinds of different stuff when they launch the camera. And if the color, why is that opening? Photoshop. Let's just do it through Photoshop. Sorry, I'm trying not to have Lightroom and Photoshop open at the same time because it crashes Zoom. Mm. Um, that wouldn't be good. <laughs> no, so that's that's why I'm playing all these games. Normally, I would just export in my computers. <clears throat> well, while we're waiting, yeah, uh, ask some more a, questions there. Yeah, wait. Question, question from Rory. What's your process for setting exposure when you use flash outdoors? Um, that is a long answer because I'm usually using um, a flash technique called high sync, um, which is you can't use a light meter for that. So you have to use the histogram on the back of your camera. And if you, it's a, it's a long, it's, it's a very manual process of trial and error to some degree of setting your exposure for the background and then turning the flash up full power to make sure you have enough flash power and then turning it down until it's lighting your subject correctly. And you know that by looking at the back of the camera and the histogram on the back of the camera, mm. which is very, I mean, not many photographers are doing this type of technique where they're um, using this kind of flash technology, but it allows me to overpower the sun from 60 feet away wow. at high noon, which has never been possible before. So what I just did here in Photoshop. So for me, I don't feel like I can fully work up my images just in Lightroom. I feel like I have to go to Photoshop and I won't go into all the reasons why. Um, but I just clicked on a little action there that built all these layers so it, we didn't have to spend time going through them. This is just a cleaning layer if I need to do any retouching, which I don't do a whole lot of unless there's dust spots. You know, I might do a little levels adjustment here. And this will be a really good, just show you why I do this. Um, it's gonna allow me to kind of recover and I'm holding down the option key if you're wondering what's going on there. Um, I'm gonna set my output levels to what Getty tells me to do there, even though I don't really work with Getty anymore. Um, and by doing this levels adjustment and holding down the option key, I can see what's clipping over here. Maybe if zoom, there we go. So a little bit of those clouds are clipping. It's not the end of the world, but I can grab my brush over here and use black and paint with maybe 9% might be a little aggressive. Let's see if I can get that back. All right, there we go. Make my brush was clipping. Bigger. Was that highlight or shadow clipping? It was highlights clipping. So I'm just gonna brush over that and you're not gonna really see a whole lot happening. But when I click on this again, what you'll see is that I have basically undone my adjustment on those clouds so that almost nothing is clipping and what this allows me to do is just kind of extend the dynamic range of the image file for a wider range of tones. Um, and then I can just, you know, maybe adjust the brightness of hair. I can go back. If I did a huge levels adjustment, I might adjust the vibrance because the levels affects all these things. And this is my dodge and burn up here. So one of these curves is brighter. That one's brightening and this one's darkening. And so if I choose my brush again here, and I won't get too crazy. Uh, I'm going to have like three or four percent just so you can see it. I usually do this at one percent. You know, I can kind of come in here and just darken this down or I can come up to the sky and darken that down even more if I want to, you know, just to help match. And these are very subtle adjustments. You probably won't see anything as we're doing it. It's only when I click it on and off that you're like, oh, okay, I see what he's doing. So very subtle adjustments like that to finalize my image and really, this is very similar to the darkroom back in the day, you know, Ansel Adams would dodge and burn his images to kind of give it the final pass. So, so I'll stop sharing here. When you're, uh, when your clients get your images, are they looking at those images on a, do you, do you generally ask them to make sure they have a good wide format or excuse me, wide gamut monitor to be able to view these on and calibrate it? I tell them, um, in all of my emails, when I send the download links, I have a whole paragraph about these images were worked up on a top end 
calibrated monitor at these settings, which my settings, I have my, I'm kind of super anal about colors. You can tell because my office walls are gray, 18% gray. Um, and I tell them my settings are at 6,500 degrees Kelvin at a gamma of 2.2 and a brightness or luminance of 120 candelas per meter squared. And I say, look, if you're watching, looking at these images and you don't have a calibrated monitor that's calibrated to those settings, you know, then you're not seeing what I'm seeing. Um, and I have some clients that come back to me, you know, that have old monitors. I mean, it's kind of amazing. Some clients have ancient computers. You'd be shocked. Like some of the biggest clients out there just don't have as good stuff as most photographers do. And they're like, mm, can you add some more saturation? I'm like, hold on a second. <laughs> what are we looking at here? You know, let's make sure we're talking on the same, you know, yeah, spades to that. spades here. Yeah. Um, I have a question from Scott. Is there much encroachment? I think what he means is competition mm -hmm. um, on the photography market by those working with high realism, ray traced computer graphics. Are you seeing competition from those folks? Not in my world, because my world's about actual humans doing pretty epic stuff. So doing CGI with that would be, you know, interesting, but not necessarily accurate. You know, it's not accurate to that person who's doing mm -hmm. the real thing. Mm -hmm. But in other genres like real estate and cars, especially like probably 80% of the car ads you see are all CGI. There's no photography done. They basically did modeling of the car and then they created some landscape and put the car in there. Um, so that's happening in some genres of photography for sure. The CGI is really becoming quite amazing. So straight up product photography is probably more of a place um, where you would Definitely. experience that. Yeah. Okay, have one from Jeff. Uh, do you calibrate your monitor in each environment you're working with, you're working in, uh, for example, a hotel or a studio or mm -hmm. a tent on the location. Yeah, definitely. I mean, interesting thing about monitors is their color calibration can be affected by differences in gravitational fields at that area. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if I need to work something up, I will take a little calibration device with me and calibrate the monitor. But for most of my clients, I'm lucky in that I can come back to this, which stays here. It doesn't travel with me. Um, and or if I'm on a big shoot, like a pharmaceutical or a really big shoot, where we're still shooting outdoor stuff, but I might have a Digitech with a cart, you know, on a road or somewhere next to me, you know, so we can look at the ASO monitor and make sure we're getting stuff on the spot with the client there. Um, those are for the mega jobs where it's hundreds of thousands of dollars on the line. Right, um, right. But, and they, you know, the interesting thing, people ask this, like how do photojournalists do it? Well, they might work it up on their laptop, which is calibrated as well as it can be, you know, in, wherever they're at in the world. But then it always goes back to the newspaper or let's just say National Geographic, for example, who I work with sometimes. They have an amazing digital lab where all of the imagery gets worked up for the magazine. And those guys are dialed in to the nines. Um, and they use ASO monitors, I'm pretty sure. Um, so, you know, even though I shoot it in the field and I might tweak it out in the field on maybe not the best monitor in the world, before it gets published, it goes through rigorous color management. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, fortunately, when you're working with professionals at that level, they're generally going to have similar equipment. So that's that yeah. makes it nice and consistent as it goes all the way through the process. Totally. Um, a little bit more about uh, some of your work. Um, mm -hmm. Of all of these extreme sports that you shoot, um, which one do you get into the most in terms of, you know, even if you weren't shooting at the time? Well, I mean, I, I'm still a climber at heart. I still climb. Ice climbing is my favorite sport in the world. Um, and in the winter here, that's why I live in Santa Fe. I'm really close to where you, Ray, Colorado is. I'm five hours away. It's just in Southern Colorado, north of me. And, you know, that's a huge reason I moved here to be close to that sport. So that's definitely the sport I'm probably most excited about for me doing um, and also photographing to some degree. But 
I'm really excited about all the sports because I just find it fascinating. You know, for me, it, the, the mental aspect is actually more interesting than the physical, physical aspect in so many ways because all of these sports have their own physical, you know, things you have to overcome and deal with and fitness levels that, you know, have to be really high to do some of these sports. But it's just, I mean, running off a cliff, I mean, the mental aspect of it is often far more difficult to deal with for all of the athletes. And I can understand that as a climber, as a skier, as a kayaker, you know, the sports that I do do on a, you know, I'm not a world-class athlete at any of these sports. I'm decent at a few of them. Um, but just the mental, I wouldn't say games, but the mental things they have to deal with just in terms of overcoming their fear to do what they do. And they're constantly pushing that, you know, and it's interesting with adventure sports, people like to call them extreme. And maybe one of the sports I photograph is extreme. And I'd say the wingsuit base jumping qualifies as extreme. <laughs> the rest of them are just, you know, adventurous. Um, you're constantly assessing risk, but as an athlete, you know, you start out, let's just say for mountain biking, you don't jump off a 60 foot cliff just out of the blue as a professional mountain biker. You started out when you were six years old and you built a little ramp with a cinder block and a piece of plywood and you jumped off the curb and then you could just never stop pushing that 1% every time you did it. You built a bigger ramp, then a bigger ramp. Oh, then you went to the BMX park and you just kept pushing it until you got to the 60 foot cliff at the Red Bull Rampage, you know? So that's what most people don't see when they see the surfing images, you know, those people have been surfing since they were four years old, mm -hmm. you know? And they're the best in the world in one of the most amazing places in the world. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, another no one for you. Um, yeah. So you started out as a physicist and at some point decided to become a photographer. So what was the defining moment <laughs> that, uh, that caused you to switch careers and, and move into what you're doing now? Well, interestingly, the reason I went to physics, um, I had been doing art since I was like three years old. So my, in all of my school, I was always doing art classes in you know, elementary, junior and high school. And basically they ran out of art classes for me in high school and I just came in and did whatever I want. But I also studied science. So I kind of felt like I'd done a bunch of art stuff. And so I wanted, to, I was also really wanted to be an astronaut. I had big dreams, still do. Um, I wanted to be an astronaut, a pro tennis player or a pro photographer. Hmm. Um, I played tennis for like eight to 10 hours a day for like a decade in, high, in junior high and high school. Wow. I wasn't good enough. That's what it came down to for tennis. So I went into physics to basically start going the science route for astronaut training. And by the time I got to the end of my university days for a bachelor's of science, I also started rock climbing and got really obsessed with rock climbing. And that kind of steered me away from getting a master's and applying for the astronaut core. Hmm. So variety of different adventurous ideas there, you know, some of them panned out, some didn't. And it was climbing that basically got me into photography just to share my adventures. And then I saw the pictures in the magazine and was like, huh, my pictures are look a lot like those. Maybe I should send them to the magazines. And <laughs> next thing you know, they're getting published in the magazines. So uh -huh. so as a as somebody who was actually doing the sport and picking up photography that that caused you to realize, oh, wait, I had this dream. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, yeah. I and I had done photography for like two years when I was 13, 14 and 15. One of my teachers taught me how to use a film camera and develop film at the school I was going to. So I was very fortunate to have that mentor early on. So yeah. well, I think that puts us uh, at the top of the hour. So better uh, wrap this thing up. Uh, Michael, thanks so much for joining us today and hearing your, uh, love to hear your story and um, you know, hopefully we can have you back sometime. Excellent. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Azo. Thanks everyone for joining.